Dragon Destined, a slow burn, sexy paranormal romance. Written by Carl Lockhart and Cassie Alexander. Read for you by Victoria May. Chapter One The car that came to pick Andy up was black like Damien's, but it wasn't a Pagani or being driven by a dragon. Andy sat in the back of the Uber and looked at her phone with that, I'm expected somewhere, don't kidnap me, pretense that solo women keep up. Although in her case, it wasn't entirely true. She'd snuck out that night after getting a call from her brother who'd been missing for three weeks. No one knew where she was, not even her roommate. She was okay with that. She'd worried Sammy enough lately. Her driver cleared his throat politely, glancing back at her in the rear view. <clears throat> Nothing personal he said, but I do downtown runs a lot. You either have too much clothing on for this place or not nearly enough. He wasn't wrong. The Lynx was a nightclub with a reputation, which was exactly why Andy was going there. She gave him a tight smile and hugged herself with Damien's leather jacket. She was only wearing it because she hadn't had time to get her own coat cleaned, or so she told herself, and it had nothing at all to do with the fact that it still smelled like him. I'm good, thanks. The driver let her off right in front of the building. Last call was four, and it was about 20 till. She knew from her old life hustling with Danny that now would be ripe with opportunity if she were still interested in playing games. The same kind of stuff that had gotten her brother into trouble in the first place. But she'd stopped, gone to nursing school, and become legitimate. Her brother, he'd skipped out on his bail bond, then out on her until about an hour ago with his strange cell phone call, asking for help on a bad connection which had brought her here. She bit her lips and watched the entrance to the club. Well-dressed, drunken people stumbled out, casting arms up like the streetlights were too bright for them. But then she saw him. Damien. She remembered his touch on her skin and the way he'd... Her heart flew into her throat and her stomach nodded. She could handle herself. She could handle this him. This didn't have to be awkward. In fact, maybe she could. He turned, and it was definitely not Damien. Her heart fell, and her stomach didn't relax, and the weirdness she was feeling? Most assuredly not disappointment. It was exhaustion from last night's shift, was all. It was fatigue from trying to come to her brother's rescue yet again. She'd vowed on the steps of the courthouse after realizing she was stuck with a $10,000 bond to be done with Danny's shit permanently. And yet, here she was, all because he'd called her Andy Bear. How long had it been since he'd said that? When they were 16? She could remember it now, her going off on her first date, and him threatening to hurt the guy if he hurt her, out loud in their living room when he'd picked her up. It had been humiliating and making his Andy Bear promise to tell him afterward if anything needed breaking. It had been fucked up. Later on that night, after absolutely nothing had happened, no matter how much she'd wanted it to, she'd screamed at him to never call her that again. Because of all that, and so much more, she was tired now, which was surely why she was taking a moment and watching the back of the man who was not Damien, with a queasy sinking feeling, until the crowd blocked her view. Andy inhaled and shook herself free of her past. She walked up to the door, the heels of her low boots clicking the pavement, and went straight up to the bouncer. Hey, is Julian here? If he is, can you tell him I need to speak to him? Tell him it's Andy, Danny's sister. The man was shaped like a gorilla, and his thick brow rose in disbelief, but then he shrugged and called it into the walkie on his collar. Someone responded in his ear, and he reached over to open the door. Right this way. Thanks, she said, stepping inside. The music was overwhelming, trying to pound a pulse into the last part years of the night. Luckily, the places she'd gone with Danny to play poker and pool had been quieter, because if she'd hustled here, she'd be deaf. She hovered by the door, arms crossed, trying to look like she didn't belong so that Julian would find her more quickly. Hey. A lean man in his thirties with dark curly hair and brown eyes appeared in the thinning crowd, with a drink in each hand. His shirt was sharp and shiny, just like his shoes. Andy knew he was a promoter, whatever the hell that was, 
and that he also sometimes helped Danny sell his boosted aftermarket car parts. Andy, he shouted, barely audible over the noise in the club. Good to see you again. Drink, he offered, pushing one on her. Andy didn't trust him, and she didn't trust her drink not to be roofied. Thanks. She pretended to be happy, taking it anyhow. Can we talk? Of course, he said, gently taking her elbow with his free hand, directing her around the dance floor to the back. They went into an office and he closed the door, which cut out all the treble, leaving just the bass as it reverberated like a drum in its frame. He sat down backward in an office chair, letting it splay his legs, while she sat down on a short couch that she was sure had seen its share of effluvia. She held her hands around her drink, careful not to touch it. Did you rethink my awesome idea? Andy squinted. Which one was that? Julian and Danny were full of ideas, and none of them were good. About diverting some meds from the hospital to me, he said, making a gimme gimme gesture with his fingers. She laughed nervously. Yeah, no, I need my license. One of us has to be straight now to keep the other out of jail. I heard about that, Julian said and tisked. He left you holding the bag? Pretty much. Andy gave him a tight grin and got to the point. Do you know where he is? Nope. As good as Andy was at reading faces, Julian's gave nothing away. If you did know, would you tell me? She asked, and he laughed. If I did know, which I don't, I'd tell him you were concerned and he needed to get in touch. He patted his own chest. I got a sister too, you know. I sympathize. Andy set her drink on the floor and brought her phone out to show him. Do you recognize this number? He called me from it and said things were bad. Julian took the phone and squinted at it. Not off the top of my head. Hang on. He set his drink down and pulled his own phone out, typing in some numbers before double-checking hers. Ooh. What? She leaned over. He flipped his phone around to show her the S in his contacts list. It was full of people's names with charming extra appellations like Shiny Jamil, Slutty Sarahi, and Stupid Fucker Joe. But his finger was pointing to one in particular, with the same number that matched Andy's. Stay the fuck away, Argento. I take it that's not really his last name? Andy asked as Julian put his phone away. Maybe it is an Italian, I don't know. But if Danny's with him, just give up. Why? Julian shook his head. I ain't saying. I don't want to wind you up into making bad choices. But if Danny's in danger, if he told me so himself, she pressed. He frowned deeply and lifted his cocktail for a long swig before speaking again. He's a dangerous dude. Always wears a lot of silver, including guns. You don't want any of him, trust me. How about you just tell me everything you know and let me be the judge of that? How about no? Julian rolled his eyes. I mean, come on. You can't just barge in here like you own the place and ask for favors. He slid one foot out and carefully nudged her cocktail closer. I mean, I require some foreplay first. Have a drink, at least. And he glanced down at the glass, more determined than ever not to touch it. I don't have time for this, Julian. Just tell me where he is. What good would that do? The cops aren't going after him. Not for Danny. Andy knew the police in her town had no love for her brother. Fine, I'll tell a bounty hunter. There's a warrant out for him, right? Because you know so many of those types, Julian said, leaning back, letting his eyes rove up and down her body. She huddled back into her coat. A pris like you, trying to figure out where to find him? No way. He stood and shook his head slowly, making a show of how much he couldn't help her, and she was acutely aware of how he was blocking the door. Now, if you could promise me a vial of fentanyl or two, or a sheet of oxy. Fuck no, she almost spit. Shit like this was why she'd had to stop playing games with Danny. Gambling for tuition was one thing, but now that she had her license, she wasn't ever going to risk it again. Oh, no offense, Julian said with a smirk, waving his hands back and forth in dismissal. I mean, he's only your brother and all. Although if he's on Argento's shit list, that's gonna be past tense, 
real soon. She stood, trying to take up more space, and used her best, disappointed in everything going on here voice, the one that sometimes got through to drunkards and psychos at work. And to think Danny used to talk so highly of you. He made you sound like the shit. Like you were his family, not me. Why do you think he never ratted you out in any of his dumbass schemes? And now, when it would cost you nothing to be even vaguely helpful, you can't be bothered? Julian stared at her coldly. He always said you could be an annoying bitch, you know that? She swallowed, but held her ground. If Danny didn't want to hear her opinions on his activities, then he should have kept his goddamned mouth shut. Fine, Julian huffed, appraising her again. What do you got? Your phone is old, I don't need that shit. Andy blinked as he went on. And you're cute, but a bad lay, I can tell. Does nagging women ever actually work? Andy asked him. You tell me, he said with a leer. You feeling anything? Yeah, no. Look, other than drugs, what do you want? She had $10,000 in an envelope at home right now, courtesy of Damien. But if she acted like cash was an option, Julian would shake her down to the last buck. He sucked on his upper lip, then jerked his chin at her. That's a pretty dope leather coat. Andy froze. It's just a fucking coat, she told herself. Just dead animal skin sewn together to keep someone warm. It's not even yours. And Damien is not yours. He never will be. And besides, that's what you wanted, remember? All right, she said, sliding out of Damien's coat, taking everything of hers out of the pockets and shoving them into her jeans. Julian took it from her and put it on. It was too big for him, but that didn't stop him from smoothing the leather with his hands. When he was done appraising it, he nodded. Argento is down by the docks. He's in the shipping business, which is another reason you should stay away from him. You cross him, they won't find your body in the bay. He'll just ship your dead ass to China. Charming. And you can't be any more specific? Julian broadly shook his head. Not even if you brought me dilated. Andy frowned. Some information was better than none, but the docks were huge. Even if her brother was in danger, it wasn't an area she could tackle solo tonight. But she had to do something. She wove around Julian, off to figure out what that was. Hey, he shouted as she reached the door. The bass outside had turned impossibly loud, all the better to shake the last patrons of the night into the street. I look good in it, no? he asked. She knew by mostly reading his lips. No, she said, flipping him off with both hands before walking out. Other club patrons kept her company on the sidewalk as she waited for her ride. As much as she wanted to, she didn't keep her phone out. Just because her two gens old iPhone wasn't sexy enough for Julian didn't mean there weren't other people who'd be interested in swiping it, and all the people stumbling out of the club looked like easy marks to her. So she waited until she was buckled into the back of her Uber to pull it out and hopped into her recents category. After Danny had gone missing following the hearing, she'd texted their Uncle Lee, who she knew had both money and connections. She'd never pressed to find out from what or with whom because her mother had told her that was rude, but now she wished she had, because Uncle Lee had promised her he'd handle things. But what had he been doing all this time? And why hadn't she asked him what was happening sooner? She supposed a part of her was just tired of dealing with Danny's shit and had been perfectly happy passing it off. Andy scrolled through her contacts for the upteenth time, trying to figure out who else she could call. She stopped at the name Blackwood, and her finger hovered. It probably wasn't even Damien's real number, but some work number, or a burner. She should just delete it. It'd be better for everyone involved. Her thumb hovered over the delete button just for a second, then scrolled past it with a sigh back down to Uncle Lee and started typing out a text. Hey, Uncle, I'm sorry it's late, she lied. But Danny just called me from a strange number and said he was in trouble before we got cut off. I know you just got back to town and the last thing you need is to clean up another Danny mess, but I don't know what to do. He said something about the docks and some guy named Argento. She kept lying because she might as well give him all the information she had. 
Again, super sorry. Thanks for letting me reschedule last week's dinner. Look forward to seeing you tonight. Love you. Hey, her driver said, startling her. It was the first thing he'd said all ride. You're not going to be sick, are you? He started swerving to the side of the road. Huh? No, why? Sorry, you just looked sick there for a bit. He shrugged in the rear view as he pulled them back into traffic. It's a hazard of picking people up from clubs. Oh, no, I'm fine. He wasn't wrong, though, Andy thought while staring out the window. Chapter Two The second Damien's car door opened that evening, Grimalkin appeared as a seal point Siamese nearby. Grimalkin had been with him his entire life. All royalty of the realms had familiars, but he still wasn't sure if he knew Grimalkin's true form, only that it favored cats. So, about that cheese, Grim began, trotting over to wind around Damien's legs. Can I place another order? Damien knelt down to knuckle the cat's head. Grim had been patient, for him, and getting cheese delivered was likely the easiest task on his list of things to do today. Certainly, what would you like? He asked as Grimalkin purred loudly and started to drool. Ew. Damien wiped his hands on his jeans, standing up. I can't help it, okay? Grimalkin trotted beside him as he made his way to the mansion. I need one wheel of fromage dauphinois and one entire wheel of aged parmesan, the good stuff straight from Italy with the crunchy crystals that they don't usually export. What happened to the last one? Damien asked, knowing full well Grimm's appetites. Don't ask, Grimalkin said, with a whisk of his tail, running inside as Damien pushed the door open before stopping to look back. The dog has his human skin again. It's about fucking time. Damien's attention surged. It had been a long week since they discovered a fucking mini portal inside Zack, which Andy and he had surgically removed from him. If he closed his eyes, he could almost smell her apple and salt water scent. Soon, he promised himself, and inside, his dragon rumbled. Zack had been a wolf ever since the full moon that had put him back together after their operation. His brother Austin said it was a consequence of all the damage he'd taken while human. He could believe that, seeing as he and Andy had sieved through all of Zack's intestines to look for the portal, but that didn't mean Damien wasn't impatient for answers. It's time to have a conversation, Damien said, letting some of his dragon's magic carry his voice through the house. A door slammed, and then a half-dressed man in jeans came racing down the stairs while fastening his belt without shoes or shirt on. He was the embodiment of summer, a golden, well-tanned blur with shaggy bronze hair and ocean blue eyes. He was muscular, like all wolf shifters, and unusually for a werewolf, covered in tattoos. Werewolves had such an accelerated healing factor that ordinary tattoos didn't take— but once the brothers had decided they wanted them, Damien had researched and arranged for a particular type of wolf's bane to be added to their ink and flown in a shifter-aware tattoo artist who was willing to take the risk of working on them. The wolf's bane meant that all of their tattoos could never be healed away and that they always burned a little, but the brothers thought the pain a small price to pay to permanently commemorate the members of their murdered pack. The urge to do what you could to remember important people to your life after their passing was something that Damien understood all too well. He's coming too, said Austin, his shaggy hair and half-nakedness making him look more savage than usual. Where have you been, stalking your little nurse? Damien growled. As strongly as Damien had been tempted to watch Andy for the past week, he wouldn't have to physically stalk her. He was a magical being from the realms. He could just watch without her knowledge through her own damn mirror. He hadn't. Not yet. The creature inside him slithered, scales over scales, waking up. But you could. It tempted him. In this, as in all things, his dragon had much less compunction. Damien's jaw clenched as Austin frowned deeply and went on, worried for his brother. Zack didn't betray us. Whether or not his brother was a traitor, Austin's pain was genuine. You may have thought he was doing it for good reasons, Damien granted, but beings from the realms are experts at twisting words and minds. 
I'm sure they wouldn't have gotten him to betray us outright, but it's entirely possible they could have convinced him that he needed to do something terrible to save the people he loves. In the realms, pain was currency. Damien knew from watching his human mother try to survive there. Let's see what he says, Austin said warily. Yes, I'm sure he can explain, Damien said, letting his familiar cool impassivity roll over him again. Perhaps it was his own draconic nature, or the fact that he'd had to share his body for most of his life. He could detach when it was required, see the bigger picture, and not let his emotions ride him. He liked to think he'd gotten very good at it, until he'd met a certain nurse. There was another door slammed, farther down the upstairs hall, and soon, Zack was on the stairs. I can't explain, Zack announced when he reached the bottom. Everything about him seemed more controlled, more civilized, combed hair, expensive clothing, tighter, subtler movements. With his black hair and pale skin, he was a cool winter compared to Austin's heat. And it was why, with the help of a little magic, he could so successfully pretend to be the elder Damien Blackwood when it was required. The dress shirt he'd raced down in was loose, making the tattoos it exposed appear more threatening in contrast. But I have some educated guesses. Damien glanced at the half-naked Austin, who looked like a barbarian enforcer compared to his brother. Grimalkin sensed the mood, and suddenly the entryway became a cozy den with a crackling fire and warm brown leather couches, and a large cage in the corner with a comically large padlock. He had no use for the dogs, and had made his opinion clear to Damien on many, many occasions. Luckily for Damien, nobody else on earth could understand him. Grim, Damien reprimanded, and the cage disappeared. He sat down on a couch, and Zack took the one across from him, as Austin paced back and forth in front of the fire in bare feet. So, Damien said, looking at Zack, do you know what happened to you in the hospital? I told him, Austin confessed, like literally two and a half minutes ago. And you were surprised? Damien didn't take his eyes off of Zack. Fuck yes. Zack's nimble hands, the hands of a white-collar boss, unlike his brother, were quickly working up the buttons of his dress shirt. And do you have any idea how the portal got there? Damien asked, watching the werewolf's pupils and pulse for any signs of lying. I didn't even know that was possible, much less that one was in me. Zack clutched at his abdomen. There was no way he would have survived so many people mucking about inside of him if he hadn't been a werewolf. How could you not know? Damien pressed as Austin watched him. Damien was no fool. He knew where Austin's loyalties were. If he had to act against Zack, he would lose both of them today. And your father would have killed both of them already, his dragon said, watching everything through his eyes. His dragon was right. I am not my father. No, you are not. His dragon agreed with a dismissive snort. Zack leaned forward, holding his head in his hands, his dress shirt so tight across his muscled shoulders it looked on the verge of tearing. He was the very definition of a man racked by guilt, or the way that a man would act to buy time to come up with a cover story by making someone else think he was. Damien hated having to think like that, but couldn't risk not. I didn't want to tell you this, Zack said, raising his body slowly, looking not at Damien, but at his brother. But a local pack reached out to me to talk about an increase of hunter activity in the area. Hunters, his dragon growled. I know. This time, Damien agreed with his dragon's sentiment. Just because most people didn't know that magic was real didn't mean that everyone didn't, and some of the people who did know of magic were unscrupulous. One way to gain magical powers was to take a piece of a being that had them innately and incorporate it on yourself, in yourself, or in your rituals. There were almost no freshwater mermaids anymore. They'd all been fished to death for their scales. And what was worse was that once hunters gained magical abilities, it made it easier for them to find other magical creatures to harvest, like mermaid scales allowing humans to breathe underwater, setting up more mermaid traps. 
which was why Austin hadn't wanted to put Zack into a public hospital to begin with, and why he'd felt compelled to guard his injured brother there personally. Austin, however, had gone still at the first mention of local pack, the kind of still all predators knew. Which pack? Austin asked, his voice low and full of danger because he already knew what the answer would be. Zack took a profoundly long inhale, during which Austin started shaking his head. It was probably a good thing that Austin wasn't wearing a shirt because he seemed to get larger just standing there. Damien knew it was theoretically possible for the wolves to shift on a no-moon night if driven to it, although he'd never seen it happen before. But his desire for empirical information was outweighed by the fact that if both of them shifted to fight, he'd have to shift too, to stop them. After the morning he'd had with his dragon, he did not want to open that cage wide. Starry Sky, Damien said, saying what Zack couldn't. The name of the pack that had massacred Zack and Austin's own pack, the Wind Racers, in a blood feud decades ago. Zack finally met his half-dressed berserker brother's gaze. Yes. Grimlikin decided to do Austin a favor and materialize one of his weapons closer, putting a well-loved axe on the end table beside the couch. Grim, Damien chastised, not now. Grimlikin moved the axe to a table halfway across the room, but didn't allow it to vanish entirely. Zack spoke directly to Damien, ignoring his brother's concerns, focusing on the facts. Several of their packmates were tracked, captured, and ritually dismembered, which means that hunters are officially back in town. The hunters moved in packs, slowly following their prey. Intelligent magical creatures would run from them and set up elsewhere with new identities, new lives, even if the cost of fleeing hunters was overlapping packs and territory disputes, like the one that had pitted Starry Sky against the Wind Racers generations ago. Creatures that weren't smart enough or thought that they couldn't fight might get taken down, and when an area was hunted out or the remaining creatures were too strong, the hunters would move on, until the next time they came through. Damien had been careful to hide his presence from the hunters the last time they'd hit town ten years ago, which isn't to say that his dragon wouldn't have gleefully killed them, but he was busy enough guarding Earth from unearthly rifts. He didn't need to worry about earthly interest in his dragon's hide, so he'd done what any other irritated billionaire in his situation might have. He paid a lot of mercenaries a lot of money through shell organizations to run them down, mercilessly. That was when he'd first hired Zack and Austin, and he'd kept them in his employ ever since. Damien stared into the den's fire. If the hunters knew this town was inhospitable to them, why had they come back? And whose word do you have on that? One of theirs? Austin pressed his brother, the potential for violence between them crackling just like the fire behind them. You said you saw a hunter at the hospital. Damien reminded him, still considering. No, I was worried I'd seen a hunter. I saw a short, bald guy with a lot of tattoos who didn't belong there. Maybe he was just there to take a picture of Zack for the papers. I told the hospital to make him a no-info, but I also told you taking him there was a horrible idea. Shit like this is why. Austin's anger exploded with a snarl as he caught the nearest side table and upended it, and Grimalkin disappeared it in midair before it could land. Everyone knows whose family owns this place, and we had five EMTs and paramedics in here who you fucking told about a tiger attack. Blaming Zack's bizarre injuries on a quickly transformed Grim had not been Damien's finest moment, but it had worked in a pinch, and Mills had been able to get him a wildlife permit retroactively. No, Austin went on, shaking his head strongly. The fact that a lurker chose that moment to rise out of my brother could have been totally coincidental. One of their own was murdered by hunters, Austin, Zack said, his tone imminently reasonable. I saw the photos of what was left of him. Damien felt his dragon's talons flex from somewhere deep inside, as though the beast were cracking its knuckles. It was always looking for a fight. Even if that's true, and I doubt it. So, why should I care? Austin's movements were as savage as he looked. 
I hope the hunters take all of them out before we kill them. Fuck the truce. Austin, Zack protested, the very picture of reason. Enough, Damien said calmly, the kind of controlled calm that sounded dangerous. He turned toward his friend. How did the portal mirror get in you? Zack put one hand to the back of his neck and rubbed it before speaking. Well, she, she, Austin snarled, dragging his hand across his face. Of course, your dick got you into this mess. You've got to be fucking kidding me. Damien covered a snicker with a cough. She, Zack went on with the same amount of emphasis while making a studious effort to not look at Austin. Smelled amazing and truthful. The pain was real. The panic was too. Damien stroked his chin. And so, how exactly did the portal wind up inside of you? Zack looked any which way but at the two of them. Oh, God, it was a sex thing, Austin said, dragging his hand across his face, the muscles of his thick arms rippling as if the wolf inside him were fighting to escape. I didn't know at the time, Zack protested with a grunt. We were both being athletic and... You fucked her and she asked for it rough, Austin muttered, and she somehow tagged you. Oh, my God, you are such an easy fucking mark, Zack growled. Look, and why didn't you tell anyone immediately? Damien interrupted. Because of this, right here, he gestured at Austin. They decimated our entire pack. Austin's eyes went wide with disbelief. It was a generation ago. Our mother killed herself, killing everyone who had that blood on their hands. We signed the truce, you and I and the others together, so that wouldn't happen again. Isn't that enough? Zack stared down his brother, cool as the professional killer he was. Austin's nostrils flared. If a member of Starry Sky asked me for help, I would only listen to them long enough to kill them. Which is precisely why they didn't ask you. Zack turned toward Damien. Not everyone has to pay for the sins of their past, least of all people who weren't even alive back then. And when were you going to tell us about the hunters? Damien pressed, your dick almost got you killed, twice over, not to mention caused a shit ton of very hard to cover damage. I was going to tell you at least, maybe not him, Zack curled a lip at his brother. I just didn't know I was going to get bitten by an unearthly creature the size of a fucking bus later that night. Maybe you got bitten because you weren't fighting your best because you were tagged by magical pussy, Austin growled. She needed help, Zack growled right back at him, and I would go back in time and fucking do it again if I got the chance. Do her again, you mean, Austin sniped, then turned to Damien. Can you fucking believe this? No, wait, I forgot who I'm asking, Austin went on, his temper letting his mouth run. Not another word, Damien said curtly. Austin had scented Andy on him when he came home alone during last weekend's full moon. But Damien never would have met Andy to begin with, had Zack's injuries not been so severe that he'd had to hire a private nurse to watch the werewolf when his crew went out. The both of you, pathetic, Austin muttered. Say that again, Damien challenged him. The wolf in Austin flared up. Damien could almost see it rise in him like the flicker of a flame, but it was just as quickly tamped back down. I'm sorry, brother, Austin said only to Damien, his brother in arms, though not by blood. At least your pussy was human pussy and couldn't have possibly been sent from the realms or hunters against us. She's innocent, Zack said gruffly. I'd swear it with my blood. Yes, well, we've all seen quite a lot of your blood recently. Damien pinched the bridge of his nose. Now that they had eradicated all of Damien's doubts that Zack's collateral damage was in any way intentional, he needed more information. Grim, call Jameson. Grimalkin blinked slowly, and Damien knew his tech master was being summoned. Jameson had sent him a cryptic text earlier that evening regarding predicting a gate. 
It was one of their many long-term goals, the capability to predict the rifts that happened when assorted realms collided with Earth, allowing unearthly creatures to come through the tears. If they ever managed to do it accurately, long-term, Damien might finally know what it was like to have a weekend. Or a vacation. Or a mate, his dragon grumbled. It was true. One of the things holding him back from chasing after Andy endlessly like they belonged together, because no matter her recent opinion on the matter, they did, he felt it in his soul, was the knowledge that rifts were unpredictable. As it was his job to close them, he might be putting her in harm's way. But if Jameson had good news for him now, if his science was reliable, Damien could spend today filling his car full of dresses and arrive at Andy's apartment the moment she woke up, to make her try on each and every one of them for him until he couldn't control himself any longer. He'd made the mistake of being an asshole to her once, yes, but he had both the will and means to make it up to her. Zack got up to join Austin in his pacing. Grimalkin expanded the size of the room to accommodate both of them, and Damien tore his thoughts away from Andy, refocusing on the men. We need to have a little talk with whoever you slept with. Innocent or not, she's our only lead to figuring out what the fuck is going on here. If it's from the realms, we've got to nip it in the bud. Assorted realms weren't just populated by chaotic monsters looking to wreak havoc on Earth— Damien had left behind his kingdom, his family, and his father's throne. Not everyone was happy about that. And if she has information regarding the return of hunters, I want to know that too. A door that didn't exist prior appeared in the room's far wall, and Jameson walked through it, dressed casually in flip-flops, ratty jeans that let the black of his skin show through, and a Super Mario tank top that framed both his metallic shoulder and cyborg arm. D, about that text. Wait, Zack, you're back. Jameson's face showed elated surprise at seeing Zack in human form again. I was starting to get worried about you. Zack grinned back at Jameson. At least someone's happy I'm alive. These guys giving you problems? You just let me know if you need me to go all Terminator, Jameson said, giving Zack a thumbs up with his metal hand. Nah, Zack said, clapping him on the back. Can't keep a good wolf down. Or his dick, Austin added, rolling his eyes. Jameson looked between the two of them and then laughed. I get the feeling there's more to this story. But first things first, where's my sample? He held out his hand expectantly, where Zack looked at it blankly. What? he asked. My sample? Jameson asked, looking around at the rest of them. You know, the silver thing you told me about, he went on, turning toward Damien. Oh, fuck me, Damien cursed. After Andy had told him she didn't want to see him again, despite both of them clearly having had the best sex of their lives, he'd come home pissed and may or may not have explained things thoroughly to Jameson, what with him fighting his dragon down so it didn't rip the roof off his castle and fly back to her. It's not here? You didn't, like, spit it out when you woke up? Jameson asked, then leaned forward. Should I have scanned you when you were a wolf? Austin said you'd be okay. God fucking damn it. Damien kept cursing as the burden of realization sank in. No, I put it in my coat pocket. The same coat he'd gone and given to Andy. He wasn't even near her and he was putting her in danger again. He pulled out his cell phone and sent her a fast text. I need my coat back. There was no response, not that there would be immediately, but knowing that didn't stop him from staring at his phone for a moment too long, hoping he'd be proven wrong. When he wasn't, he shoved his phone back into his pocket and looked back at the men. I'll get it from her later. Now, about the rifts. Jameson winced. About that. Everything in Jameson's bearing turned apologetic as he began to speak quickly. We predicted the gate within five miles accuracy, which is a new record, but it didn't work. I thought you said you sealed it. Damien frowned, remembering the text Jameson had sent. I know I got ahead of myself. The gate we thought we sealed reopened, 
It might have been just a matter of using enough juice, maybe we underestimated it, and it takes more power to seal a rift that hasn't been opened yet. But then another one opened nearby that my algorithms didn't predict, so maybe if you keep one closed, the power surges somewhere else nearby, and some octos started pushing through. Don't worry, though, Max and Mills went to handle them. Damien's phone beeped with a text alert. Andy. He ignored Jameson as he went on, pulling his phone back out again. No. And whatever cool he had possessed earlier was not enough. Damien pulled in on himself like a collapsing star, and Jameson's words were drowned out by the static of blood in his ears. No isn't just my name. It was one of the last things Andy'd said to him, because he'd hurt her. He'd done it intentionally, when he'd been trying to save her from himself, but that was no excuse. Without thinking, Damien whirled, picked up the couch that none of them were sitting on, and hurled it into the fireplace. Grimalkin, perhaps knowing what he needed, chose not to disappear it, instead letting the thing shatter and catch a flame. Whoa, man, Jameson said, jumping back. Max and Mills are fine. They already radioed in. Damien turned and saw the three other men gawking at him. He was in no mood to explain the last conversation he'd had with Andy to them, least of all when her walking away from him was his own damn fault. I hated that couch, said Damien, striding out of the room. Let's figure out where your magic portal injection girl is, 